Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, I hope you're all doing well tonight. Thanks for joining us again uh, for our Birds of Newfoundland series. We are talking about raptors, kingfishers, and woodpeckers tonight. Um, so it's sure to be uh, full of interesting species today. So I hope that you enjoy our next hour in a little bit. Um, oh, I forgot I should introduce myself for anyone who hasn't met me before. <laughs> um, my name is Jenna McDermott. I am the assistant coordinator for the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas, which is a program run by Birds Canada. And also on the line here, we have Catherine Dale. She's the coordinator of the Breeding Bird Atlas, um, and she'll be monitoring the chat and helping out with any uh, issues that, that come up for, for the first little while. Um, Birds Canada, as I mentioned, is the organization that we work for. And um, it is Canada's voice for birds. And the mission of our organization is to drive action to increase the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of wild birds in Canada. Um, and so we are a nonprofit organization that is um, run across the country. We have offices um, through most of the provinces. But most of our, um, our programs that we have are actually mostly citizen science programs. And that just means that uh, regular people like you who are here on the call who are um, can be signed up for these programs and be involved in data collection and really getting involved with collecting information that can go into bird conservation in this case. Um, and so then you'd be called citizen scientists. So um, currently we have over 74,000 volunteers that share their time and energy and bird skills with us at Birds Canada each year, which is pretty incredible. Um, and we certainly couldn't do everything that we do without all of those folks who are involved. Um, currently in Newfoundland, we are running two different programs. The first one uh, is the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, we will be having a webinar that is specifically uh, getting more into the Atlas um, later on in this series. So feel free to come to that if you'd like some more information. But a quick rundown is that it's a five-year project. Um, anybody can be involved. Basically, we are collecting information about where all of the different species that are that breed in Newfoundland um, and how many there are. So for example, we have this bald eagle here. And you can see this map beside. Um, these are the, all the places that the bald eagle has been found in Newfoundland, the island of Newfoundland, so far um, through the the, through the breeding bird Alice in Newfoundland. Um, and so the different colors of squares indicate our certainty that they are breeding in an area. Um, and so for example, if you know of a bald eagle nest that's nearby where you are or down the bay um, or somewhere up by your cabin, that's all really good information that would be amazing to add to our map here. Um, so if anybody wants to submit sightings like that, feel free to let us know and we'd love to have that included in the Atlas. Um, the other program that we run in Newfoundland is actually for Newfoundland and Labrador, and it's the Atlantic Nocturnal Owl Survey. And it's another citizen science program where a person can sign up for a route, and they just run this route one time per year um, in the early spring. And essentially, it's a roadside survey, so it's really nice uh, for folks with lower mobility, perhaps, or... Um, who aren't as expert in bird identification because all you're doing is identifying the few different species of owls um, by sound. And they all sound mostly quite different. Um, so it's really nice survey for folks just getting in, just getting involved. Um, and so that's something that you can be involved in even this spring. And Catherine would love to hear from you if you would like to um, sign up for a route that is open or add a new route in your area. Um, so definitely feel free to reach out. If you would like to go out listening for owls. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the lands that we are running our programs that we live and work are the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq people. And um, these people have been protecting and stewarding the land since time immemorial. And through the work of the Breeding Bird Atlas and the, and the owl survey, we hope to assist that stewardship to protect all of the species that we share this land with. Birds Canada understands that Indigenous voices, knowledge, and ongoing work on the land are critical for wild birds to thrive in sustainable ecosystems, and we support the needs, aspirations, and rights of Indigenous peoples to care for the land. Um, if you'd like to check out what lands you're living on or working on, um, go to nativeland.ca. It's a really great place to start. 
Um, also, just quickly before we get into our species for this evening, I'd like to thank all of our partners and funders. Uh, without their support, we wouldn't be able to put on initiatives like this um, or even our programs that we're running right now in Newfoundland. So thanks to all these folks. Okay, um, so we'll get into our, this is our list of, um, well, for, okay, so we're doing raptors, kingfishers, and woodpeckers tonight. So this is the raptors, the Newfoundland birds of prey. And um, there are diurnal raptors and owls. We're not actually gonna go through owls tonight because we have an owl specific session on March 4th, but they are technically a bird of prey and they'll be nearby to the diurnal raptors in your field guides. Diurnal is a word that means active in the daytime. So these are um, our hawks and eagles, osprey harriers, our falcons. Um, and so we'll go through all of these this evening, of course. Um, <clears throat> just a note before we get into our species, a lot of information can be gleaned about birds of prey from how they fly or their shape in flight, their silhouette in the sky as they're flying. Um, sometimes it's difficult to tell a bird of prey species if it's far off in the distance and perched because they maybe don't have quite as many um, defining marks all the time, um, but they can also have a lot of really good defining marks when they're flying and uh, markings in the underwing or the silhouette, that sort of thing. Um, so this here is a just a little like quick guide from the Hawk Migration Association of North America. And it's a I'll include a PDF of this in a follow-up email to this um, session, like later on this week. And so you'll have this uh, that you can reference as well if you'd like. Um, and so this just sort of goes through some, some key info. It has a few extra species in it that we don't have in Newfoundland, but some key info on um, how birds fly, their flight style, their body and wing shape, um, that sort of thing. So we'll go into our first species is one that is likely familiar to a lot of folks here. Um, and this is the osprey. So osprey, um, as you maybe have seen are, are typically hunting fish. Well, actually they're always hunting fish and they, they'll hover over the water, they fly over the water, hover over the water and dive in to catch their prey um, and then fly off into uh, eat it um, or bring it back to their nest. So they can actually fly quite long distances to bring food back to the nest. So just because they're hunting in an area doesn't necessarily mean that they're nesting really close by. Um, but if you've ever seen their nests, you'll see that they're quite conspicuous, like the one you can see up on top here. They can make gigantic nests out of huge sticks. Um, often they put them on top of hydro poles because they like to have sort of a big vantage point um, on a high, uh, a high location. Um, and they're really just these huge bulky nests. They come back to them year after year and they'll just fix them up, add extra sticks. And so they just get bigger and bigger with time. Um, the habitat that they nest in is usually near lakes and rivers because they, of course, need to go there for hunting. And they can nest up to 10 to 20 kilometers from water, though. So, as I said, they could be flying quite long distances to go hunting. So, as you can see in the photos here, and maybe uh, you've seen them before in person, but this is a large raptor. Um, they're quite sizable. They have a really strongly hooked black bill, that big hook on the bottom. Um, and they're mostly this like dark brown, grayish color and white. Uh, they have the dark color back, they have a white underbelly and they have a big black stripe going through the eye to the back of the head. Um, and then if we look at them when they're flying in the picture on the left there, this is what I was mentioning. If you only see it flying, you can look up above and if you have good lighting, you'll be able to see that it's white underneath the whole body, but there's a dark patch at the, we'll say wrist, sort of that uh, joint at the wing, um, which is really diagnostic. So if they have a dark patch there um, and fully white belly like this and no other markings, then um, you're looking at an osprey, at least in Newfoundland. Um, this is a bit of a relative mark, but they have really long, thin wings. So if you spend a lot of time comparing different raptors in flight, you'll be able to pull these things out as time goes on. Um, that their wings are very long for the size of their body um, and they're very thin. Okay. 
We'll move on to another very familiar bird, <laughs> the bald eagle. Um, again, this is a bird that you often find near coastlines and water because they're also often hunting for fish um, or sometimes ducks or they're chasing gulls around and stealing their food from them. Um, <laughs> they're also very happy to be scavengers. So they will eat things that are already, um, that they find already dead on the, on the ground. Um, and they also build gigantic stick nests in trees, much like the osprey, but these can sometimes be even larger. Again, they go back to these year after year and they'll just fix them up or add more sticks to them. And, uh, there is a, a nest that has been recorded, um, not in Newfoundland. I can't remember where it is now, actually. Um, but it was weighing two metric tons, which is the equi equivalent of eight adult male polar bears. So their nests are truly gigantic. Um, but actually, they can be really well hidden as well. I, I stumbled across one a couple of years ago during um, Atlas Fieldwork, and it was just at the edge of uh, the edge of the coast in a tree. And I didn't see it until I was almost nearly underneath it just because it was so in such like a dense, dense, um, dense vegetation on the tree that I, di I didn't see the nest from the direction I was at. And I was incredibly surprised. <laughs> so was the bald eagle. Um, everything was fine though. So um, again, this is a pretty iconic bird. We have the adults that look like this. Um, so they are all dark on the body and wings and their head and tail is fully white. And they have those bright yellow really strong talons and the bright yellow, big, big, uh, heavy bill. Um, and then since they are such an imposing bird, uh, you'd expect them to have a really imposing call, but this is what they sound like. Oh, I don't know if it's, oh, it is working. It's very quiet for me. I don't know if you can hear it. Whoops. Okay, I don't know if any of you heard that or not, but they have a kind of silly sounding call considering how impressive um, and imposing of a bird they are. The bald eagles, maybe if you um, were watching birds when you were younger, um, you might have noticed that at some point in the 19, uh, the mid 1900s, they their population actually crashed um, because of the use of uh, DDT as a pesticide. It was really widely used for a while. Um, but then once that was banned, their numbers have actually increased back to levels before DDT was used. So it's a really great um, rebound story um, and a conservation success story where we we banned a uh, dangerous chemical that was being used um, so that the population of birds could rebound. Essentially, it was making the eggshells really thin. Um, and so when the birds were incubating their eggs, they would actually crack and the, of course the young wouldn't, wouldn't hatch. Um, but now it's nice to see bald eagles sort of all over the place again. We'll see if maybe we hear it again uh, as I change slides here. Okay. Um, so this is another slide about bald eagles here. And you might wonder, you know, these ones on the bottom, they're looking pretty dirty. They don't really look like our nice, clean, uh, white head, white tail bird that I was just talking about. But it actually takes five, four or five years until bald eagles get their adult plumage. So until then, they're sort of a mix of this dark brown and white um, feathers. And also when they're younger, they have a beak that is black instead of yellow. So they're changing their, their beak color from black to yellow. And they're also changing their feather color from this mottled white and brown into that very distinct white head, white tail, brown body. Um, so just be aware of that, that if you see a bird uh, like this one flying up in the corner, that's a juvenile bald eagle, but it could be already four years old. Okay, moving on to our next bird. Um, this is the Northern Harrier. Northern Harriers are fantastic little guys. I saw one today actually when I was out by the coast um, hunting along the 
sort of flat lands along the, the edge of the coast there. Um, they look different, the females and males look different. So this is the male here first. They're a bit of a medium sized raptor. So they're definitely smaller than the osprey and the eagle, but they're bigger than some of the other ones we'll see later. And as you can see from the top picture here, well, all the pictures, I guess, they have a sort of owl-like disc or an owl-like face. Um, and that's because they have this facial disc that's made with their feathers pushed forward and that helps them hunt auditorially. So they're flying over um, sort of flat grasslands or shrubby areas, and they're listening for things like, um, like frogs or toads, if there's an area with those, or like small rodents, and they're just listening as they fly over, and then they'll dive down um, onto their prey if they hear something. So that's why they have this sort of like owl, owl-like face disc. They actually nest on the ground, um, and that's in fields or marshes, so they're really an open habitat species. And when they're hunting, they're sort of having a buoyant, wavery flight. They're sort of following all of the nooks and crannies of the land um, and, and bouncing up and down a little bit on the airwaves as, they, as they're hunting. Um, as you can see, this male here is all um, pale gray with black wingtips. Um, males are sometimes called the gray ghost because they're all, all gray and pale colored. Um, if you look at the underside photo here on the left, you'll see that he's fully white underneath, just with dark wing, wing tips and dark flight feather edges, um, that go all the way down through the bottom. And you'll notice that he has a pretty long tail, um, for the size of his body. If we look to the picture from the top, you'll see that he's sort of blue gray above still pretty pale colored, and then he has a white rump patch. So the feathers along the rump are, are brilliant white. Um, and that's the same with males and females and a very important mark for them. If you see a raptor in Newfoundland with a white rump patch, it's either a Northern Harrier or one other species that we'll talk about later. Um, if you see how they're flying, uh, you'll notice that they keep their wings in a dihedral position. So that just means that they hold their wings in a bit of a Y format instead of flat. Um, and that is also a good mark for the Northern Harrier. So this is the female now. Um, as you can see, she's sort of the same size and shape, um, but instead of being gray, she's mostly brown. She's so a bit of a darker brown on top and a bit of a paler brown or like a buffy color on the bottom. And she has barring on her underwing. So instead of that um, gray, gray underwings with the black wing tips, she's sort of brown, brown and pale bars underneath. Again, we have a really long tail um, compared to the body size. We have that owl sort of looking face. But again, from the top view, you can see those white rump feathers, um, that really good mark there. The juvenile harriers can look quite similar to the female. Um, so they're also brown on top, but they have a bit of an orange tint on the belly, a more orange tint on the belly. And that can be a bit hard to tell apart, um, but you'll definitely be able to tell when it's a male um, and when it's either a female or a juvenile. Okay, we move on now to a grouping of birds called the excipiters. And excipiters are different kinds of uh, hawks that have short, short, wide rounded wings. Um, they have a long tail, and they typically have a flight pattern that goes flap, 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 glide. And so they'll repeat that, flap, flap, glide, flap, flap, glide, um, as they're moving along. And excipiters are hunting other birds, so they are often uh, pursuing these smaller birds through the trees and shrubs, and they're really good at um, maneuvering themselves through small spaces. So we have only two species of excipiter in Newfoundland. The first one is the northern goshawk. It is um, the less likely to be found, uh, but it is around. This is um, a, quite a striking looking bird as well. It's, it's quite large, sort of the size of a great horned owl, maybe. Um, and as you can see, they're this like striking uh, gray color, and they have um, slate gray wings and back and tail. So sort of the whole back is the slate gray color. If you look to the head, they have um, a 
really strong white eyebrow. And that's a really good mark for the Northern Goshawk, that really strong white feathering over the eye. Um, they have a really dark line through the eye. And then they have um, on the front, a pale gray throat and belly with some, some smaller streaking, but you only probably notice that if you're really up close. Um, the female looks the same, generally the same, but she's a little bit larger. Um, you wouldn't really be able to tell a male and a female apart um, if you just had one individual there. If we look at them in flight, you'll see that they look really heavy and bulky. The like body is just like very bulky. Um, and they'll have a really steady flight with very powerful wing beats. They're like a very large, powerful bird. Um, you can still see that white eyebrow sort of sticking out very strongly. Um, you'll notice that they have white under the tail and otherwise they're sort of finely, uh, finely gray with little bars on them. The Northern Goshawk breeds in areas with thick forest that has some open areas and they're hunting things like grouse, rabbits and squirrels. Um, and so they'll be sitting in a tree likely or on a branch, looking around, listening around, and then they'll um, they'll stoop in and dive onto their prey when they find it. And we actually have goshawks in Newfoundland year round. Okay, this is our next exhibitor. This is the sharp shin hawk, and it's quite a bit smaller. Um, it's just around the size of a blue jay. And sharp shin hawks are probably, um, if you have bird feeders out in the winter, they're likely the bird that you sometimes see out chasing your bird feeder birds. Um, they are pretty comfortable around human habitation, but they also are happy to live in uh, forests far away from humans. So they're pretty versatile. For a lot of raptors and uh, sharp shin hawks included, the females are larger than the males, um, but otherwise look uh, pretty similar. And so when we look at the adults here, um, you'll see on the picture on the left, they have this slate gray back um, that goes all the way from the top of the head, all the way down the neck, onto the, the back and wings. Um, there's another species that we don't have in Newfoundland called the Cooper's hawk, which is very similar looking. Thankfully, we don't have to worry too much about telling those two apart. Um, but this, the fact that the gray comes all the way down the neck here is a good mark between those two species. So if you're ever going elsewhere, uh, just watch out for that. The adults, um, look like this with this rusty barring on the front, um, barring being sideways lines. Uh, the juveniles who are like born in the first year, they'll actually have the other direction. They'll have streaks, brown streaks going down the body instead. Um, when they're flying, they have really sort of snappy wing beats. They fly like a smaller bird, like they're struggling in the air a little bit more um, than the goshawk that we saw earlier. And so in the exhibitor fashion, they have these broad, short wings, they have a long tail, um, and the sharp shinned hawk keeps its wings pushed forward when it's flying along. So it has um, sort of that V shape between the head and the, and, the sh uh, and the wing. Um, am I missing anything here? I don't think so. Okay, so then we'll move on from our exhibitors. And we'll move into Budios. We don't have very many of the Budios in Newfoundland, um, but this is another grouping of uh, raptors. They are birds that have broad wings. Um, they have short rounded tails. So take a look at the length of that tail compared to the length of the occipiter tail, much shorter. They often are found soaring um, on thermals. So as heat rises, um, air goes up in thermals and they'll be found soaring along um, through those those air thermals, and they typically hunt from a perch or either either that or uh, by soaring and sort of um, stooping down on their prey. So this is um, our rough-legged hawk. It's a budio that we have in Newfoundland. Um, it's found in open habitat like tundra, marshes, um, and it nests on cliff edges. So there's not a huge number of rough-legged hawks, but we do have them in Newfoundland. It's actually its farthest south um, area of its range. It's actually found throughout the Arctic typically. So that's probably why there's maybe not as many of them in Newfoundland. Um, and marks that you know it came from the Arctic is because it has a tiny little bill. It almost looks like a little 
pigeon bill or something. It's so small. Um, they have really fluffy plumage and small feet and the, the feathers go all the way down the legs. And that's all adaptation to cold Arctic life to stop heat loss. When you see a rough-legged hawk um, hunting, you'll see that it will fly along and hover in a spot like an osprey does before it um, dives down on prey. And they eat small mammals typically. Um, and they are another species that will hold their wings up in a slight dihedral, meaning that little V as they're flying um, rather than flat out. Oh, so I wanna just show Closer look at the feet here. Um, so rough-legged hawk gets its name. Of course, um, you can see now from its legs having feathers all the way down to the feet, whereas most other raptors actually have bare legs with no feathering on them. Okay, let's look at some uh, color marks here. So we have um, two different color morphs of rough-legged hawk. There's a light morph and a dark morph. And morph is maybe not a really great word because they can't change from a light morph to a dark morph and vice versa, like within their lifetime, they just are one or the other, sort of like if you have brown hair or if you have blonde hair. Um, so this is the light morph. <clears throat> the light morph, remember how I said earlier, uh, Northern Harriers um, are the only ones that have a white, white rump feathers other than one species. This is the other species. So you can see it a little bit here. They have a white, a white rump um, in this picture where the bird is just taking off from a tree. Um, and so that's a really good thing to look for in the light morph. If you look at when they're flying, if you're looking from underneath, you'll see that they have a sort of pale body, uh, pale head and underwings uh, with this dark band on the belly, as well as these black wrist patches and that was similar to the osprey that we saw earlier with black wrist patches, but osprey don't have this um, dark belly line. Um, and they also have sort of these dark tips on the wings and white flight feathers. So if we take a look at his head from this perching picture, you can see again, the small bill, almost like a little pigeon or something like that. Um, just this tiny little bill and a pale head for the light morph. <laughs> Oh, and I forgot actually to say, sorry. Um, this bird here is actually a juvenile uh, with that really dark breastband. The adults don't have quite such a dark breastband, um, but they have dark speckles down the breast and belly as well, instead of that huge band there. Okay, but they still have um, these black wrist patches, which are a really great mark for them and the white rump. So we'll look at the dark morph now. <clears throat> as you can see, is you know shaped similarly, of course, um, but they are almost fully dark from the top. You'll see that the rump is not white; it's actually black, um, and there it's all dark feathers for the most part. And if we look at the uh, picture from underneath, you'll see it still has those black wrist patches, but instead of being starkly different from the rest of the wing color, it's um, it's blended in with the the dark feathers that's all throughout the um, at the bottom of the bird. And so the only pale section is the flight feathers, but they all have dark tips as well. Um, so it's sort of like an Oreo <laughs> underneath, <laughs> but it's just the chocolate cookie on top. Um, and then they also have um, a black tail band uh, that you can see really from underneath, but you can also see from, from above. So that's the, the light morph and the dark morph of the rough legged hawk. Okay, we'll move along. It was the only booty that we have in Newfoundland, so that's easy. <laughs> we'll move on now to our falcons. We have a few more of them. Um, falcons are have this very distinct shape, especially when we're seeing them flying. They have incredibly pointed wings, and that's a really good thing to look for when you're looking at raptors in flight is the shape of the wings. Falcons have very pointed wings, um, which can pull them apart. They also have a long tail, so it's not like that short rounded booty -o tail. And they are really fast flyers typically. Um, they're chasing their prey uh, in midair often. Um, and so they're really good at um, maneuvering again and um, powerful flight that can catch their prey while they're flying. 
Um, the falcons in Newfoundland all migrate away, so none of them will be around in the winter, um, but they will come back in the summer, happily. Okay, so the first one is the American kestrel. It is a tiny little falcon. It's um, probably the size of a robin or maybe even smaller. Um, just a little guy. <laughs> They're not super common in Newfoundland, but they can be found um, on the island. And this is the smallest falcon that we have. They nest in cavities um, in trees, in open habitats. So we're looking at sort of open fields or um, tundra kind of areas where we have some standing trees. And so they're nesting in a cavity in those standing trees. When they're just sitting there on a perch, they'll often be bobbing their tail. Um, and you can see that they have pretty striking plumage. We have the male on the left and the female on the right. The male is quite colorful. He has this like bright rusty colored back uh, with a little spot on top of his head, like a little toupee um, as, along with this very colorful tail. And then he has blue gray wings, which are contrasting there. Um, and he, you'll see that the male and the female both have two black bars going down the face. That's an important mark for the kestrel, or sorry, the falcons is to notice the markings on the face. Um, so two striking black bars going down the face. Female here on the right, as you can see, is sort of uh, similar to the male, but is much more brown and much more muted. Let's look at them when they're flying here. Um, we can see uh, uh, the colors that we were looking at earlier uh, on the tail of this male here, we have that bright rusty color. And you'll see that bold, a bold black bar at the base of the tail. Take a look at the wings. Those are really long and pointed, aren't they? Um, very sharp pointed wings. And that's very typical falcon look. Um, if you're looking at uh, watching how they're flying, you'll see that they are really a small bird. So they look pretty unsteady in the air. Um, they're often sort of fluttering almost. You wouldn't necessarily expect them to be like a powerful hunter. Um, and they will actually stall and hover in the air, sort of like the osprey and the rough-legged hawk that I mentioned earlier. They are eating things on the wing, so they're catching things as they're flying. And kestrels are so small, they're actually often eating dragonflies, which is really cute. <laughs> and you can see the one here on the right is actually having a snack while it's flying right now. Um, so again, this is the male here on the left with that bold black bar uh, at the base of the tail. The female here on the right doesn't have that black bar, um, but they both do show, if you look at the base of the wings, these sort of white pale windows. Um, if you have good lighting where the sun is behind them, you can see these really pale windows where you're seeing uh, the light coming through. And that's a good mark for the kestrels when they're flying. Okay. We'll move on now to our next Merlin. We're just sizing up a little bit, or sorry, our next Falcon, we're sizing up to the Merlin. Um, Merlins can look sort of similar when they're backlit. Um, they're only a little bit bigger than a Kestrel, but they do act much more powerful. Their flight style between the two is very important to tell them apart um, if you're not getting a really good look at the colors. So the Merlin has really powerful wing weights. It looks like it's a bird that knows where it's going. Um, it has a really straight flight and looks like it has intention. Uh, whereas the kestrel will flutter and sort of flutter around, be buffeted by the wind a little bit, and it looks just far less powerful. <laughs> um, that's something that, of course, can take some time to, to cue into. Um, but as you see more of these birds going by, you'll be able to tell them apart from the flight style. So again, we have um, a bird that is pursuing its uh, prey on the wing, it's hunting on the wing, and it's hunting dragonflies, uh, same as the kestrel, but it's also hunting small birds, um, and it will chase them chase them uh, in flight. When we look at the colors here, we can see overall the merlin has a dark appearance. Um, it's mostly dark brown with some lighter, lighter patches. Um, it has a white throat, dark brown back and wings, and its belly is heavily streaked with brown. <clears throat> um, when you look at the tail, if you can see it fanned out, you can see that it's dark with uh, dark and, and pale bars on it. Um, 
And if we look at the markings on the face, I said that for falcons, the face markings are really important. You'll see that it has a white throat, as I mentioned, but it has um, this dark sort of mustache stripe going down. And it doesn't really have a second uh, dark stripe like we saw in the Kestrel. It just has uh, the one going down um, bordering the throat. Um, if you see it perched in a tree like this one here on the right, you'll see that the wingtips are shorter than the tail. Um, so that's a good little mark to pay attention to. And merlins are often found in open treed areas again, but you can also find merlins in towns. Um, if you're in Cornerbrook, there's uh, a pair that lives right in the middle of town there. Um, it's been there for years, and I'm sure that there's merlins scattered across the island in towns all over the place. <laughs> Okay, we'll move on now to the peregrine falcon. This is our, our last falcon that we have in Newfoundland. Um, and it's quite a bit larger. It's um, significantly larger. And you'll see that it's sort of, this is the adults again, of course. Um, it's this slate dark gray all over the back, um, the back and head. You'll notice in the picture on the left and on the right, it has this really bold, dark mustache stripe that goes down from the eye all the way down, bordering the throat. So if we compare that to the Merlin that we saw earlier, the Merlin's uh, mustache stripe was much thinner, um, not nearly as bold and dark, whereas the peregrine falcon, it almost connects with the color of the, of the back and head. Um, they also have this brilliant yellow around the eye um, and a yellow um, bill as well. If you look at the length of the wings, they actually meet the tail. Uh, it's a little bit hard to tell with the angle of this picture. And again, we have this really falcon um, shape in flight with these incredibly pointed long wings, um, which are so important to um, mark out a falcon. And underneath, you'll notice it has this sort of dark barring. Peregrine falcons are so very exciting to watch when they're hunting. Um, they'll sit on a perch and they'll stoop down on their prey. Um, so they sort of dive down like a fighter jet almost. They're so fast. And they can actually reach speeds of 100 meters per second when they're stooping down on prey. And so they're incredibly, incredibly fast. Peregrine falcons nest on cliffs, uh, very tall cliffs. Um, so they're only found in a couple of places in Newfoundland and um, they can be quite territorial. This is another species that declined a lot in the 50s, um, between the 50s and 70s because of the use of DDT, but this is another species again after DDT was banned, has been rebounding successfully, uh, which is really a great conservation story. Okay, and so we have reached the end of our raptors for the evening. We'll move on to our kingfishers, which is really just one species, um, the belted kingfisher. Um, some of you might have seen this as well. If you have a cabin on a pond or a river, uh, they are associated with water as well because they're hunting fish. So they actually will hover over the water as well. Um, they'll fly along, hover over the water if they see a fish below, and they'll plunge into the water, catch the fish, and then come out to eat it uh, perched somewhere else. As you can see, they have a really strong, uh, long pointed bill, which is great for spearing fish in the water. We have the male on the left here and the female on the right. They look quite similar, as you can see, um, but take a look at the breast and belly. The male on the left here has one dark band, sort of a necklace. The female has the dark band, but also a chestnut brown band underneath. So she has two bands and the male has just the one. So they are white underneath, sort of a white collar, and otherwise they're this blue-gray on the head and back and wings. Um, you'll note also that in the picture here, the male looks like he has no crest and the female does have a big crest. They actually, males and females both have a crest and they can just put it down or put it up uh, depending on if they're alert or if they're sopping wet or <laughs> that sort of thing. Okay, so now we'll see it. Um, in in flight, you'll see you can see the the 
the breast band and the sort of necklace band. So you can see there's two here, it's a female. Um, but if you have them backlit, you'll notice that there's a big white wing patch um, near the tips of the wings. And that's really great to tell them, um, tell them apart from us, other species. Some of you might have heard this uh, kingfisher rather than having seen it before, and I'll play it for you. It has this uh, very distinct rattling call, doesn't sound like much else. So they do that actually while they're flying. I'll just play that again. So if you've heard that rattling call uh, along the water before, um, it's been a kingfisher, maybe you haven't had a chance to see it, but um, they're also very cool because they, they nest in burrows in sort of soft substrates along uh, riverbanks or coastlines. Um, so they actually make, they dig out a hole in the bank and they'll nest inside of there. Um, so you can often find them nearby to areas like that. Oh, okay. Okay, so we'll move on now to our woodpeckers that we have in Newfoundland. Um, this is the list that we'll go through tonight. And a lot of people are familiar with, you know, the concept of a woodpecker. Um, they have sort of this upright posture against a tree trunk. They climb up and down the, the tree trunks looking for insects. They have these sort of chisel-like bills, which they're using to drum into the bark um, to look for food. They have really stiff tails, which they use to prop themselves up so they can move up and down um, the trunks. And typically males and females look mostly the same, except for males usually have one color patch that's added in and females don't have that certain color patch. Um, so in this case, we have uh, males here with this extra dab of color on them. And woodpeckers um, nest inside of cavities, which they uh, excavate, they drum out or dig out with their beaks um, that they use for nesting as well as roosting through the year. Okay, so our first one is probably our least common species in Newfoundland of woodpecker, the yellow-bellied sapsucker. Um, has a pretty silly sounding name. <laughs> um, and it's called a sapsucker because uh, it actually Oh, I should wait for the next slide because I have a picture. I won't tell you about that until next slide. <laughs> Let's look at how it looks. Um, the yellow-bellied sapsucker, you might think, um, should have a lot more yellow on it. But as you can see, uh, the yellow wash on the belly is like pretty hard to see, uh, especially if they're sort of far away. So that's not really the best mark to look for on them. Um, what you really want to look for is this uh, bright red cap on them. And the males here on the left have also a red throat. You'll see that female on the right has a white throat instead. That's the extra pop of color the male has. And a really diagnostic mark for this species in Newfoundland is this really prominent uh, white bar on the wing. It goes from the shoulder down uh, to the flight feathers. There's no other species of woodpecker in Newfoundland that has that really bright white bar down the wing. Um, so that's a good thing to notice for yellow-bellied sapsuckers. Um, otherwise, they're sort of black and white, typically, um, with a black line through the eye. Um, they have some messy white bars along the back. And on the belly, of course, they're this pale yellow, but it's mostly uh, mostly just kind of whitish colored. Um, these are, as I mentioned, pretty uncommon in Newfoundland, but they are seen yearly around the island um, and they breed in mixed woodland. So uh, we're talking about a mix of deciduous and coniferous tree. And they actually migrate away in the winter. So you won't see them this time of year. Okay, so now onto the sap sucking part. Um, they actually have this really cool feeding style where they're, they'll drill different uh, rows of little wells into the trees. And so the sap will come out of the tree into those wells and then they'll come back and drink the sap out of those, um, and as well as eat the insects that will be attracted to that sap. So if you see this sort of formation of um, holes in a tree, it's because there's been a yellow-bellied sap sucker there, which is really cool. Okay, 
We'll move on to the downy woodpecker. This is a species that's quite common around the island. It's our smallest woodpecker in Newfoundland. Um, and as you can see, it's pretty much black and white. Um, other than the male who's on the left, who has that little red spot on the back of the head as well. Uh, the female has no red at all. Um, you'll see they're white on the belly. Um, they're a mix of black and white on the back. So they have this white patch on the back, black wings with white spots. Um, and they have um, sort of a, a white eyebrow, a white line through to the back of the head, as well as a black line through the eye to the back of the head, sort of striping. Um, these woodpeckers are small enough that they can actually forage on small branches or weed stalks. So if you have like goldenrod or smaller shrubs, um, they can easily sit on the top of those and they won't bend over because they're quite tiny. And they are found in anywhere with trees, um, within towns and parks as well. So they could definitely be visiting your feeders in the winter um, or hanging out in your yard in the summer as well. If we take a look at the bill, we'll see that it's quite short compared to the size of the head. And that's an important thing to note because the next species I'll show you right now looks incredibly, incredibly similar. So this is the hairy woodpecker. You might think I'm showing you the exact same bird. <laughs> I'll compare the two on the next slide. Um, so again, we have mostly a black and white bird. The hairy woodpecker is actually significantly larger than the downy woodpecker, but that's really hard to tell if you don't have them standing side by side. Um, so that's something you can compare with the size of the trees that you know around your yard um, or other things that you can compare size with. And so we have um, similar marks here. We have a white belly. We have black on the uh, top of the head and the wings and tail. We have white spots on the wings. We have the male here on the left with that red spot on the back of the head. And we have sort of those white and black stripes going strongly through the face. But then you'll see that he has a big long bill compared to the size of the head. Let's look at that more closely. Here's the two compared. So we have the downy woodpecker on the top and the hairy woodpecker on the bottom. Again, we can see the colors are very similar. Um, the sizes are very different, but um, it's most important for these species to look at the size of the bill compared to the size of their own head. So the downy woodpecker up here on the top has a small stubby bill. If you turned it back onto the head, onto its own head, as we can see in the bottom little thing here, it's A. Um, if you turn the bill onto the back of the head, it only just about reaches the back of the eye. So it's less than half the length of the head. Whereas the hairy woodpecker, which is B here on the bottom, if you turned his bill to the back of the, uh, to back onto his own head, you'll see it goes way past the eye. It's greater than half the length of the head. So if you have um, a, one of these woodpeckers in that you want to identify, take a look at the size of the bill compared to the size of its own head. Okay, we'll move along to a different looking woodpecker, the American three-toed woodpecker. Um, this one is around the size of the hairy woodpecker, maybe a little bit larger. And it, you'll see its name, it says it has, uh, or it's the three-toed woodpecker. Most woodpeckers actually have four, four toes on their each foot, um, but the American three-toed woodpecker only has three. <clears throat> and this bird is found in old growth boreal forest. You're not gonna find them really in towns or near human habitation. They especially liked old burned areas or um, areas that have had some sort of disturbance. And they have a really interesting feeding strategy where they flake the bark off of conifer trees to find the beetles that are hiding underneath. So they're not necessarily pecking holes into the trunks, they'll just flake the bark off um, and eat what's underneath. Again, they're mostly black and white. Um, so they are, sort of darker on the back with black wings. Um, they have white barring on the back and they have black and white barring on the sides as well. Um, and then a pale white belly, which we can't really see in the picture. You'll see the male on the left here has a, a dab of yellow on the top of the head, uh, whereas the female on the right has a fully black top of the head. And you'll notice in comparison to the downy and hairy woodpecker, um, this like color over the eyebrow where the downy and hairy woodpecker had a really strong white section above the eyebrow. 
um, the American three-toed woodpecker, it's, it's kind of um, a little spotty and not nearly so strong. Okay, we have another species that looks um, a little similar to the three-toed woodpecker. It's called the black-backed woodpecker. And um, this species also only has three toes. The knowing the number of toes is not really important for identifying it usually <laughs> because you might not get a great look at their feet, but it's just sort of interesting. Um, they look pretty similar to the three-toed woodpecker, but they have an entirely black back. They're very sort of a glossy black and they don't have any of that white barring on the back either. Um, so their, their name really matches them here. <clears throat> we have the male on the left again, has that yellow patch of color on his head. The female's on the right with no yellow patch, a uh, fully black head. And then we have um, both the male and the female have sort of this black barring on the sides and they have a white belly. You'll notice they don't have really much white going behind the eye at all. They just have sort of a white uh, chin strap, I guess. <clears throat> and um, yeah, that's most of the, the main marks for them, but that black, that glossy black back is um, a really great mark. This bird is also found um, in old growth conifer forest, so another species that's not super likely to be amongst human habitation, though there has been some cases of them uh, being in parks in the middle of um, cities and that sort of thing. And uh, there was one in a uh, camping park that we found last summer as well. So they can be a little bit more likely than three-toed woodpeckers. But they also like disturbed areas like burns um, or dead trees, and they will also flake the, the bark off to get, um, get beetles from underneath the bark. <clears throat> Here we'll compare the two um, to each other. Oh, I maybe have some pictures sitting on top of each other incorrectly. <clears throat> so I apologize for that. Um, but we have the black backed woodpecker on the left here. See that glossy black back of the American three, to three toed woodpeckers on the right. And you can see there's more white uh, barred along the back <clears throat> and showing through the face as well. Um, we have a female here on the right of the American three toed woodpecker and a male here on the left with that yellow crown. Okay. Oh, and I forgot, I put in a little video here. Um, of uh, the feeding style of black-backed and three-toed woodpeckers. So as I mentioned, they do that uh, flaking of the bark. Um, so let's see if this video will work. You can see them in action. Yeah, I'm just gonna fast forward a little to here. Nope, I can't apparently. I guess we'll just watch the whole thing. <laughs> So it's not doing a lot of flaking here at the beginning, but around halfway through, um, it will start to sort of really flake the bark off a lot. So this is a, a black-backed woodpecker here. There you can see it's really just flaking the bark off instead of making holes. Um, so if you see that sort of marking on a tree, uh, you'll know that a black-backed woodpecker or a three-toed woodpecker has been around. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we'll go on. Uh, this is actually our last species of the night tonight. This is the northern flicker. It's also a woodpecker, though it looks very different from the ones we've already seen tonight. Um, it's quite large. So um, it's around the size of the others that we've seen, except for the downy woodpecker, maybe a little bit larger. And the northern flicker likes open habitat with some trees in it. So um, it also nests in cavities in the trees, uh, but it does like sort of more open areas as well. It also migrates away in the winter. Um, so it's not around right now, uh, but those, the ones who are mostly black and white colored are around right now. So the downy and hairy woodpecker will still be around in the winter. The black-backed and three-toed woodpecker will also still be around in the winter. Um, as you can see, this almost looks like a tropical bird. It's It's got very crisp and bright colors. Um, it's mostly brown all over, but it's this rich color brown as a black band along the 
um, breast here, almost like a necklace. The male has a black stripe that goes from the base of the bill down like a mustache. And the female doesn't have that. She has a, just a pale face. Um, both the males and the females have a red stripe on the back of the head or sort of the back of the neck on each side. And they have these really distinct black spots along the belly and breast um, that almost look like someone painted them on with a little paintbrush. If we look at the um, top right picture, that's the male again up there because you can see his mustache, a uh, black mustache stripe. You'll see on the back, they have black barring along the back and they have a white rump, um, which is really bright uh, and brilliant if you see them flying away from you. Uh, if a woodpecker has a bright white rump, it's a northern flicker. If we look at the underwing here, this is a female down at the bottom because she doesn't have a mustache stripe. You can see that they have bright yellow underwings and bright yellow under the tail as well. Um, so these brilliant yellow feathers. So sometimes you'll see a feather discarded on the ground and you'll know that it's definitely a northern flicker because of this color of yellow. Um, flickers can be kind of confusing to identify as a woodpecker because you'll often find them feeding on the ground um, as well as in the trees, like along the tree trunks, but they'll often sit on the ground. They really like ants. And so you might see them hopping around in your yard um, on the lawn. So that can be a little bit confusing, but they are woodpecker as well. Okay, so that was our final species for the evening. It's a bit of a shorter a shorter night tonight because um, the owls have been moved into a different week. Um, but we'll go into our um, skill testing section of the night. And of course, this is um, just for fun and <laughs> it's anonymous. So hopefully the polls will work this evening. And let me see here. Okay, so here's our first species. And I'll put up the pool here if I can manage it. Okay. Okay. I think you should be able to see the first pool. Yes, I see some answers coming in. Perfect. So who is this species? We have lots of folks participating. This is wonderful. I'll just leave it open for 10 or 15 more seconds. So get your answers in if you want to try it out. Okay, I'm going to close this up and share the results with everybody. Um, so we have a majority of saying hairy woodpecker. We have nobody said northern flicker, which is uh, great because that's a, the one that we just talked about, which is brown, tropical looking. We have a few American three-toed and downy woodpeckers. I could see um, where you could get those mixed up because they do have that sort of white barring on the back as well for the American three-toed. But remember, neither the male or female has red on the head for the American three-toed woodpecker. So that one would be out. Um, downy woodpecker and hairy woodpecker um, look very similar, but uh, as we can see, the bill, if we turned it back on the head, is more than half the length of the head. Um, so this is a hairy woodpecker. Very good. And, okay, here's our next bird. I will put up the next options here. Okay. So who is this species? This one's a little bit trickier because we have him flying and a little far away. <laughs> Oh, 
I'll leave it open for a few more seconds if you want to try out an answer. Okay, I'll close it up now and share that with you. Um, so we have answers in all the categories here. Um, again, this is this is a little bit trickier because we don't have any really strong field marks. So we're gonna play the elimination game. Um, we'll start with goshawk on the bottom. The goshawk would have um, a really strong white eyebrow, um, which we can't see here. We would be able to see uh, from this angle. So it's not a goshawk. Um, also the ones that we've seen were the adults in here and they were fully gray. Um, okay, we'll move on to the Merlin. The Merlin, um, if you remember, the Merlin is one of the falcons and they all have really strong facial markings. So you would see a big uh, sort of dark uh, mustache stripe going down from the eye for the Merlin, as well as those really, really pointed wings that you see on the falcons. So we have Northern Harrier and sharp -shinned Hawk left. Um, Northern Harrier would have much longer wings. We would have a face that's shaped like an owl, um, though it's a little bit tricky to tell, of course. And there is a lot, um, um, this uh, this bird has a lot more um, streaking and barring than we would see on a Northern Harrier. So even a female would would not have this sideways barring. Um, she would have, have streaks going up and down, um, which does leave us with the sharp -shinned Hawk which was our majority answer here. Um, so we can just sort of pick out that slate gray uh, hood going down into the back. We have these sort of um, short wings and long tail with that shoulder poking up forward um, at the same level as the eye here when it's in flight. So that's that was a pretty tricky one. Okay, we'll move along to our next bird here. Okay, who is this species? Sorry, it's in the middle of eating a meal. I'm looking for the species that is alive, of course. Leave it open for 10 more seconds or so. Okay. I think most of the answers have come in, so I'll close that up and share our answers. Um, so we have a bit of a mixed bag of answers here. Um, we have uh, a bird here that has um, a strong facial marking, so this mustache stripe going down which eliminates rough-legged hawk right away because that's a mark that we're looking at for our falcons, which are the other three here on the list. Um, so we'll move on to um, the peregrine falcon here on the top. The peregrine falcon um, does have that um, dark patch down below the eye, but the peregrine falcon is really um, this like dark slate gray on the back and pale on the belly. So it's not this uh, brown hue that we have for this bird here. Um, as well, the face patch is very dark and bold on the peregrine falcon. The American kestrel, if you remember, it was that cute little tiny uh, falcon that we had. So it was a mix of gray and really rusty color. Um, and as well had two stripes on the face, two really black stripes on the face. And so this is a Merlin here. Um, it's sort of dark brown all over, sort of dark all over, brown all over, and has this one sort of smudgy kind of uh, mustache stripe. That was a tricky one again. Okay, so we have the Merlin. Now we have this bird here. Da -da -da. Launch that, okay. Who's this species?
So far, we're split between two species. Oh, here comes a third. This is going to be a good one. Okay, I'll leave it open for 10 more seconds or so. Okay, I'll close that up now. Share that. Um, okay, so everyone remembered the Merlin from the last slide. Last, last slides. So that's fantastic. Um, <laughs> we don't need to mention him then. Um, okay, and we have this bird in flight here. Um, I see folks have noticed the white rump, I assume, uh, which has led them to the rough-legged hawk and northern harrier. Um, both of those do have a white rump. The short-eared owl, we didn't talk about today, but if you come to the owl talk um, in a couple of weeks, you will see those. They don't have a white rump at all, but they can look very, very similar to this species here. Um, and also occupy a lot of the same territory. Um, so we have rough-legged hawk and northern harrier. We have majority saying northern harrier, which is correct. Um, so this would be a female uh, because she's mostly brown all over. Uh, the male, again, the gray ghost would be all gray um, or pale underneath. And the rough-legged hawk does have that white rump patch, as we mentioned, but it doesn't have that sort of owl look on the face. And also um, the light morph, which is the only one that has the white rump, would have really pale wings and undersides, um, except for those black wrist patches, which we don't see on this bird here. Um, so this is a northern harrier. Oh, and I spelled northern wrong. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so that's a northern harrier. And we'll move on now to this next bird. Let's get this one open. Who is this species? I'll leave it open for 10 more seconds or so, so get your answers in. I'm gonna, oh, we have a few trickling in. Okay, I'm gonna close this up now. Okay, so we have, um, so I have equal numbers of rough-legged hawk and bald eagle juvenile. Um, and then we have osprey and peregrine falcon. So the peregrine falcon, I'll start with that. And uh, we can eliminate that because a peregrine falcon would have a much paler uh, look overall. It would have a really dark uh, mustache stripe that would be quite prominent against um, a really pale face. So it has a dark hood and mustache stripe. Um, the osprey as well would... It, um, wouldn't be dark overall. So osprey are sort of a mix of dark brown and white on the belly. Um, so we wouldn't have this overall dark brown bird. So we have a rough-legged hawk and a bald eagle juvenile. And um, the bald eagle juvenile, as we saw near the beginning, um, can be this really dark brown, but they actually have patches of white all throughout the body. Um, so there's some like paler brown on this bird, um, but not really... Um, not really any like white patches or like white feathers. The bald eagle also would have a really big hefty bill um, compared to this bird, which has kind of a little dainty bill, right? Sort of like that kind of pigeon look on its head, like I mentioned earlier. So this is a rough-legged hawk. Um, and this is the dark morph, of course. And so they're pretty much dark all over with only a little bit of paler color on the underside of the flight feathers on the wing. Um, so yeah, this is a dark morph, rough-legged hawk. Okay. Very good. We'll move along now to this bird. I think we have nine species. So there's uh, this and uh, just a few others after.
I'll leave it open for 10 more seconds or so. A lot of answers have already come in, which is wonderful. Okay, I'll close this up now and share the results here. Um, so we have uh, most people saying bald eagle, a few people saying osprey. This is a bald eagle. Um, so it's really the only species that has this distinct uh, white head and you can see the white tail just poking out a little bit here as well as this dark brown body. So, um, and that big hefty bill. On osprey, this angle of this bird actually is a little bit tricky because it has like some dark markings on the face as well, um, which the osprey has that dark line through the eye, which would be quite a lot more distinct um, than this bird. And they also have um, a little bit smaller of a bill and just sort of a more slender appearance generally. Um, so this is, but this is a bald eagle. Okay. We'll move on to this bird. Where's our options here? Okay. Who's this? Got a few overlapping features on this bird, so it can be a little tricky. Got a lot of answers in already, so I'll just leave it open for 10 seconds or so. Okay. I'll close it up now. And um, I don't even know why I put owl as an option, but I'm glad no one picked that. <laughs> um, so we have rough-legged hawk, osprey, and peregrine falcon were our other options. Um, most folks said osprey. It is an osprey that we have here. But as I said, we have some overlapping marks, so I'll just go over them uh, for a second. So the rough-legged hawk, the light morph, does have these dark wrist patches but it doesn't have the dark that goes the rest of the way along the base of the uh, wing feathers towards the body. It would be pale throughout that section. It also wouldn't have that um, that dark stripe that goes through the eye down uh, down through the neck. So that sort of eliminates the rough-legged hawk. Um, we also have peregrine falcon here. And um, so it does have sort of this dark area around the face uh, contrasted with the white. So I could see why um, the peregrine falcon came into the answers, but remember the shape of the wings for falcons. They're really sharp and pointed. So we're looking for those very triangular wings. Um, whereas this osprey has these more broad uh, broad wings here, um, as well as all this dark, dark markings under the wings as well, which we wouldn't see in the peregrine falcon. Um, so this is a nice view of an osprey. Okay. Moving along back to um, our woodpeckers. Who is this bird? If the pool window is covering up the picture, you can also um, just move it across the screen a little bit by dragging it. Uh, so far, it seems to be okay. This is our second last species, I think, of the night uh, for the quiz. So get your answers in. I'll leave it open for 10 more seconds. Okay, let's close this up and I'll share the answers with you. Okay, so we had four options, hairy woodpecker, downy woodpecker, black-backed woodpecker, and American three-toed woodpecker. We don't have any responses for hairy or downy woodpecker, which is um, correct. So uh, they would have had much uh, stronger white and black markings on the face. 
as folks must have noticed here. So we have blackback woodpecker and American three-toed woodpecker. Um, we have most people saying American free-toed, which is correct. Um, the black-backed woodpecker would have a fully uh, shiny black back um, all the way from the head down to the tail. Um, it would have shiny black instead of having these sort of white and black bars that you can see here. Um, and this, of course, is a female because it doesn't have any yellow on the head. Um, so we do have the American three-toed woodpecker here. Very nice, everybody. Let's move on to our final, I think this is our final uh, quiz of the evening. Okay, who is this bird? Close this up shortly. I think we have most of our answers in already. Okay. I think that everybody's um, got their answers in they wants to. So I'll close this up and share this one. Okay, so we have nearly everybody saying American Kestrel and that is uh, correct. So uh, the Merlin and the Peregrine Falcon are our two other Falcon options here, um, which are the ones that have you know, those uh, really prominent markings on the face going uh, going downward. Um, and the Merlin would not have two black markings. He would just have sort of one sort of smudgy, um, smudgy bark going down from the eye. It wouldn't really have that gray, um, gray patterning on the head either. Mostly uh, brown and uh, dark brown and paler brown. So the American Kestrel here is our smallest falcon, cute little guy with these very prominent uh, two marks under the eye. Wonderful. Okay, so let's just make sure I didn't have any others poking up here. Nope, <laughs> that's the last one. So thank you everybody so much um, for coming out tonight and participating in uh, the little quiz at the end there. It's really nice to have people um, trying out their answers so we can get a chance to look at some birds together. Um, as always, feel free to check out our website, follow us on social, social media. Um, we post things about future events that are in person as well there as well. And hopefully we'll see some of you next week for our next session, which I don't remember what it is about. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any. I'm going to... I think maybe Catherine has stepped away, but um, I'll open the chat here and see if I can find any questions. Oh, and next week is woodpeckers. I just looked it up in my calendar. Um, okay, so somebody's asking, Mary's asking if Northern goshawk revisit their nests. Um, I assume you mean from year to year, and that's a really great question that I am not entirely positive about, but I think Possibly, yes. I'm not really sure. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, just scrolling back if there's any questions. Folks can feel free to uh, unmute themselves as well if they have any questions. Um, We've seen one. mostly thank yous here in the chat, Jenna. Okay, I just see one here from uh, Carol. Which morph of rough-legged hawk is more common in Newfoundland? Um, I think the uh, light morph is more common in Newfoundland, but typically they're not super common generally. Um, and you have a question here from Mary Beth who wants to know if uh, you can tell her whether northern goshawks revisit or I think maybe reuse is what she's going for, their nests. Yeah, um, I just mentioned that one and I'm not entirely sure, but I think that they probably would. <laughs> I think I actually looked this up and they do okay. in fact 
uh, do that. Yeah. So they, right. it says that they may be reused. So they may not, uh, but they, it has been known to happen. Okay. Sorry, I missed you mentioning that one, Jenna. Yeah, no worries. Um, just scrolling back. Oh, a lot of people have northern flickers right now. Okay, interesting. Hmm. Are downy woodpeckers found in more northern climates than the hairy woodpecker? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, and I am not sure about that either. Catherine, do you know? I don't. Um, the range that is a really good question. Uh, I don't think so. I think that they they pretty much entirely overlap is what I'm thinking because there's a lot of work on, or there is some work, sorry, on niche splitting between the two of them and that, that they may use uh, different parts of the tree, um, but I'm mm -hmm. not actually sure. Okay. Yeah, I need to grab my uh, field guide to look at their range map. Yes, and I actually had my field guide out uh, earlier. <laughs> um, somebody has asked why sharp shin hawk. Do you know that? Because I don't know that one at all. I have wondered uh, that like why they're called that. Um, they are very similar, as I mentioned, to the another species, the Cooper's hawk. And people say, <laughs> which I think is really unhelpful unless you have them in your hand, that the sharp shinned hawk have like a really skinny leg for the size of their body, basically. So it's like a sharp shin. Whereas the Cooper's hawk, which looks very similar, has like a bigger, bulkier leg. Um, that's my best explanation for that. <laughs> okay. I mean, if they were named by somebody that had them in hand, then that would make sense. That's It's a great question, actually. It's a funny name, yeah. and I don't know why. Um, oh, and the question about downy woodpeckers and hairy woodpeckers was based on the size of the beak, um, because we had you had talked about mm. the small bill being an adaptation for Arctic mm. living, um, yes. so the difference in bill size. I think the important thing to remember there is there are lots of different evolutionary pressures that can shape things like bill size, so uh, it doesn't necessarily have to reflect something like a northern climate. Yeah, that's true. But that is a very interesting thing to think about, actually. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, it looks like the questions are finished now, Jenna. So thank you very much for an excellent presentation, as always. And we hope to see you guys here next week uh, when Jenna will be telling us about warblers. And I will be in Trinidad seeing some of our workers <laughs> on their uh, on their winter trips. So I'll report back the week after. Yeah, wonderful. Just what we want. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks all. See you next all right. week.